Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mohammed Sian Najm. And at the very beginning, I would like to thank you all and to thank the uh, scientific committee of our great conference for allowing me the opportunity to share my presentation here with you today titled Following Breadcrumbs in Uveitis. As you all know, in the context of uveitis, reaching the diagnosis could be a quite difficult and a challenging task. We usually resort to a detailed history, a very fine uh, ocular and extraocular examination, aided with a targeted laboratory and imaging investigations. Sometimes we are lucky. We are faced with the small clues, small hints. You might call them breadcrumbs. And if you follow these breadcrumbs, they will give you direction towards the proper diagnosis, and hence you would help your patient restoring his sight and possibly his vision. Over the next few slides, we will show you a number of real-life patients, those patients we received at Ibn al-Haytham Ali Teaching Hospital, and these breadcrumbs help us a lot in reaching the diagnosis. So this is case number one. This is Fatma. She's a 22 years old female from Baghdad who referred to us as a case of an idiopathic bilateral granulomatous panuveitis. Her story started approximately 10 years ago when she first suffered bilateral simultaneous reduction in vision in both eyes, associated with photophobia. Over the past 10 years, repeated attempts to reach the diagnosis were made, unfortunately none of which were successful, and in one attempt, uh, particularly in 2018, uh, one laboratory test, it was EGRA test uh, for TB, came positive. And based on that test, she was diagnosed as a case of a presumed ocular TB, and she received systemic anti-TB treatment for one year with no improvement in her ocular inflammatory condition. You can see the picture I placed it in the first presentation. This is an important clue. Our patient liked to wear heavy makeup during her uh, serial ocular examinations. By the time we received Fatma, she had the visual acuity of counting fingers in both eyes. The intraocular pressures were elevated, and the anterior segment examination, as you can see, has an AC reaction of plus uh, 2 in both eyes. There was uh, extensive posterior synechia, significant cataract, that precludes adequate visualization of the uh, fundus for our patients. Definitely, we had to send our patient for a B scan, which showed the presence of a vitreous opacity, a vitreitis, and hopefully no underlying retinal detachments. At this point, we stopped. What would be the next step? Where is our breadcrumb? How do we proceed with our patients? At this point, and particularly for this patient, we investigated the, the not the eye, but the eyelid. We asked our patient to remove her, her heavy makeup in the upper eyelid, and just she removed it, we found this hyperpigmented skin patch overlying the upper eyelid. Now this thing changed things a lot. If I tell you that we are dealing with a case of bilateral, uh, non-infectious granulomatous panuveitis with a hyperpigmented skin patch, the first thing that will came into your mind is VKH, Volcay and Aguiharada disease. And this was our assumption too. So we placed our patient on systemic steroids, systemic immunosuppressive treatments, and we planned for surgery. We performed cataract surgery. We, we performed pars plantar vitrectomy. We removed the vitreous opacity to have a proper visualization of the fundus for our patients. And this is his, her. A wide field fundus image of the eye. It confirms our suspicion. She has a numerous white spots of along the mid peripheral part of the fundus. The fundus is highly uh, hyperpigmented. These are Dillon Fox spots that are usually associated with cases of Volcay and Aguiharada disease. So the learning objective from case number one is that you should follow your breadcrumbs, and sometimes your breadcrumbs are not in the eye. They might be extraocular, and for this case, they were in the patient's eyelids. In case number two, this is Raban. He's a 29 military guy from Baghdad who came to us complaining from a sudden onset of decreased vision in his left eye over the past two weeks. The visual acuity was 6-6 six, six in the right eye and counting fingers in the left eye. The intraocular pressure and the anterior segment examination were both are remarkable. But when we examined the fundus, we found this uh, particularly in the left eye. You can see there is a white retinal patch in the posterior pole, approximately three to four discs in diameters, with an indistinct feathery like margins, an associated retinal hemorrhage, and an overlying area of uh, vitreitis. What's even more important is that by the time of presentation, we have two uh, daughter lesions, one just above the optic disc and the other one in, uh, above the initial main lesion. 
By the time we received Robert, he was already on systemic antitoxin treatment. He was believed to have toxoplasmosis. This we did not believe. At the very least, this is not the typical case of toxoplasmosis. So how do we proceed? Do we dig further into the history? Do we need to perform further examination? Do we send for other laboratory or imaging investigations? For Robert, we have uh, to send the patient into two given directions. The first one, we perform a simple OCT scan for the right and the left eyes. And this is the OCT scan of the lesion. As you can see, there is a hyperreflectivity corresponding to the area of retinitis. So we are definitely dealing with the retinitis. There is inability to distinguish the retinal layers, overlying vitritis, subretinal and intraretinal fluids are also present. But what is even more important than what I have just said is the absence of choroidal involvement. And this is very important. So we are dealing with retinitis and retinitis only, not a retinal or choroiditis. And this largely excludes toxoplasmosis as being the typical cause for this case. Next, we check the immune status for our patient. So we send them for an HIV test. And this is the laboratory test at our hospital. It came positive for an HIV. Now things have changed a lot. Now we are dealing with an immunocompromised HIV positive patient who presented with retinitis. And I think you all know that the most common cause of retinitis and immunocompromised HIV patients would be cytomegalovirus retinitis. Based on that assumption, we started treatments with uh, canacyclovir for approximately one month. We notified the localized health authorities and we sent the patient for a specialist to deal with other potential opportunistic infections in the brain or other parts in the body. And this is the, the results after one month of treatment. You can see the complete resolution of the area of retinitis, uh, both on the fundus appearance and RCT. The learning objective from this case is that sometimes your breadcrumbs are not always clinical, rather they can be found in an imaging investigation, as in this case. This is case number three, and this is Zahra. Uh, she's a 49 years old female from Al Hilla, Iraq. She came to us presented with or referred as a case of recurrent attacks of bilateral granulomatous anterior uveitis. We received Zahra during the era of COVID. She initially had a mask worn, so we do, couldn't see her skin lesion of like the nose at the initial presentation. The, uh, the visual acuity was 6'9 both eyes, the intraocular pressure was normal and the anterior segment examination showed only an AC reaction of plus one in both eyes and nuclear cataracts and only a one o'clock hour of posterior sinus kill in the right eye. Things got a lot more exciting when we examined the fundus and as you can see, you can see a cyclorosed uh, retinal vessel in the inferior part of the retina associated with an adjacent area of retinal new vascularization. So we are dealing with an area of, uh, with a case of an ischemic vasculitis rather than an anterior uveitis. By that time, we perform a sectoral laser photocoagulation to hinder the retinal new vascularization process. Now, let's reevaluate our case. This is no longer a case of anterior uveitis. It is an ischemic retinal vasculitis with a peculiar ischemic lesion. So, we send our patient for a dermatologist who, after evaluation and taking a biopsy, she confirmed that her nose lesion is actually nothing but lupus vulgaris, which is a skin lesion found in patients with TB. So this is no longer a presumed ocular TB, this is a confirmed, a biopsy proven ocular TB. And as you all know, the most common uh, cause, infectious cause of ischemic retinal vasculitis in our society here is uh, ocular tuberculosis. And this is, was uh, based on a study uh, carried out by our great professor, Dr. Dr. Faz Shekhachi. How did we proceed? We give her systemic anti-TB treatments, uh, sectoral laser photocoagulation, and intravitreal anti agents were used for our patients. What is the learning objective? Sometimes ocular TB might be associated with a fluoride active systemic disease. This is the assumption rather than the normal case scenario for these patients. The final case is Mariam. This is a 22 years old female from Baghdad. She's actually a medical student. She came to us complaining from a sudden onset of decreased vision in the left, in the uh, right eye, I'm sorry, and photophobia. Her visual acuity was 624 in the right eye, 66 in the left eye. The intraocular pressure and the anterior segment examination was normal. And the fundus, you can see there is a discrete white spot uh, going with the vascular arcades and surrounding the optic disc in the right eye. Things become more obvious when we acquire a fundus autofluorescence image. You can see there are numerous hyperautofluorescence lesions corresponding to the side of the ocular pathology. 
now we are having, let's reshape the presentation once again. This is a young myopic female who presents with a unilateral white patches associated with sectoral visual field defects and scrotomas and photophobia. And there is white lesions in the fundus. We, we think that we are dealing with a case of a multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. How do we confirm it? This is actually a clinical diagnosis with a very good prognosis. We send the patient for an RCT scan once again. And in the RCT scan, you can see the discontinuity in the external limiting membrane, retinal photoreceptor layer. But what's even more important is the RCT NGO, which tend to be normal in those individuals, as you can see in this case. We didn't give the patient any treatment. We only followed her up. And eventually, she restored excellent vision with a 6-6 vision in both eyes. Thank you for your listening. Hope to be an interesting lecture. Shukran Jazeera.